So our next uh, speakers we have here, uh, by Hart, Andrea Hoxley, and uh, Henry Sagerman. Well, thanks. Um, so uh, we're going to describe uh, this, well, one of the two things we have in the art exhibition. It's a virtual reality game called Hypernom. Um, so uh, Hypernom, it's, it's a virtual reality game uh, that uses the virtual reality headset in an, an unusual way. So the usual way that the VR headset is, that is used is you turn your head and it sort of rotates the camera uh, so that you're seeing a different part of the virtual scene. And we're doing something else. We're using the movement of the headset to move you through the space. So um, there's three degrees of freedom in the orientation of a headset or a camera or whatever. You can sort of go side to side, you can go up and down, and you can roll. And so you can see, I mean, I'll explain this more, but <laughs> rotating Vi's head rotates the camera, and you're sort of moving through the space in some way. And so we're going to explain what way that is. Right, so, so we're using the orientation of the headset to navigate through the space. So I need to tell you what the space of orientations is. So, um, so it turns out the set of orientations of the headset, we looked at this picture here. We decided it should be a three-dimensional thing. There's three, three ways you can move from any point. And I'm going to tell you what that three-dimensional thing is. So we're going to start with some base orientation. Vi's head is looking straight ahead. And we'll label that sort of at the center of a ball. And the set of all orientations are going to fit inside of this ball. And so I've drawn this sort of axis here. And the idea is that as you rotate around a certain angle around that axis, you move your point within this ball. So your orientation moves from the center, the start position. When Vi rotates 90 degrees to the right along this axis, you move a distance of, say, 90 upwards along the same axis. If we go 180 degrees, keep going. Wait, no, we're still going right. Yeah, go right. There we go. If you go 180 degrees, then we're, we're even further up at the top of this ball. The ball is radius uh, pi, say. And we can keep going. We can go back the other way. 90 degrees this way, back to the start. We're moving down again. 90 degrees the other way. And 180 degrees. Now notice, rotating by 180 degrees in one direction leaves Vi in the same position as rotating by 180 degrees in the opposite direction. And so if I'd chosen a different axis to rotate around, then I would move out a different distance. Well, I'd move out a distance along that axis. And so hopefully this gives you the idea that all of these different orientations that you can get to by rotating along some axis are filling up all of the points in this ball. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, there's a, a little bit of a question here. Why does that cover all orientations? There's something called Euler's Rotation Theorem that proves that you can get from any orientation of a three-dimensional object to any other one by choosing some axis and rotating by some angle around that axis. So this gets you everything. Now, there's something else to notice. Um, so I, I mentioned Vi is now facing the same direction, having rotated by 180 degrees in either direction. So this point and this point are really the same. So they should be identified. So we're identifying opposite points. We're gluing together opposite points of the ball. And this is something called um, RP3, real projective space. So you may be more familiar with RP2, the real projective plane. So this is where you take a, a two-dimensional ball, otherwise known as a disk, and you glue opposite points on the boundary. And when you do that, you get RP2. Same thing in three dimensions, when you glue opposite points on a ball, opposite boundary points on a ball, you get this thing called RP3. Uh, RP2 has the property um, that it's double covered by the two spheres. What does that mean? Um, so you can think of, if you take sort of two copies of this RP2, and you say, well, when I come off this edge, I'm going to, instead of getting glued up here, I'm going to I'm going to sort of go on to a different copy of the same thing, and you carry on and you glue it all up. These two copies of RP2, when you glue them correctly, give you the ordinary sphere in three-dimensional space, which has a topology I would call S2, because it's a surface, it's a two-dimensional object. And so in the same way, RP3, the space of orientations, is double covered by S3. People may be well aware that I've done a lot of stuff with S3 and visualizing things in S3 by projecting them down to R3. So, um, so what is Hypernom doing? You're moving around your head orientation, that's moving you in RP3, but for the purposes of having a space to wander around in, it turns out to be better to be moving around in S3. So what we're seeing here are cells of uh, one of the four-dimensional polytopes, the regular four-dimensional polytopes in S3, 
and they're getting moved about, or, or rather Vi is moving through the space by moving her head around. And so here's, we're going to try and do the, the 120 cell hypernorm instruction manual. Oh, I should mention, why is it called hypernorm? It's hyper as in hypersphere, and norm as in nom nom nom. The point of the game is to eat all the cells. And how do you eat a cell? You eat a cell by getting to a particular place, and when you get close enough to it in S3, you eat the cell and it disappears. So how do you get to all of those places? Where are they? So, um, so there's one cell in the middle, say at the start, when, when Vi starts. And here it is, and this is a sort of a schematic picture of S3. Um, here's the, the cell in the middle. This corresponds to not doing any, it's the start orientation. You start somewhere. And it turns out that where are all of the cells with 120 cell? Their positions in S3 are related to the orientation changes that you, you make from the symmetries of the dodecahedron. It's kind of a, uh, a coincidence that this dodecahedron is the same as this dodecahedron, but just think of what are the symmetries of the dodecahedron. The closest other cells in the 120 cell to this guy are the ones you can get to by doing the smallest angle rotation. And those smallest angle rotations are rotations by uh, a fifth of a turn around the faces of the dodecahedron. So we're going to attempt to rotate Vi's head by a fifth of a turn around one of the faces of the dodecahedron. I don't know if this is going to work. I'm going to restart it. To just... Go. Oh, yeah, so that's a nomming sound. Okay. okay, so here we are. So if we rotate by a fifth of a turn, or we're eating more things, yeah, well, too bad. Too far. Um, well, yes, so going further, what are the next ones? So the next nearest orientations, which are coming from the symmetries of the dodecahedron, are the ones where you rotate by a third of a turn around one of these axes through the vertex. So if you can attempt to rotate by its head by a third of a turn around an axis through the vertices of a dodecahedron, let's move on. <laughs> uh, the next nearest, and, these, and there are 20 of those because there are you know, 10 axes through, through the vertices of dodecahedron, and there are two different ways to rotate by uh, a third of a turn. The next ones are two fifths of a turn away, um, and there's another 12 of those because there are six axes which go through the midpoints of the faces, and then you can rotate by two fifths of a turn this way or that way, so 12 divided by 2 times 2 is 12. Um, and then there are 30 more which are rotated by 180 degrees, so when you rotate by 180 degrees, you hit all of these ones. And then the whole thing is made up of, again, there's this double cover thing. To win this game, you have to rotate your head in all of the orientations of the dodecahedron twice, which means you have to rotate your head basically everywhere twice. Um, and that's the game. So in the remaining three minutes or so, we're going to attempt to win Hypernorm by rotating by space to all orientations possible <laughs> twice. And while Vi is doing that, I'll just mention, um, some of them are quite difficult to get to. You have to be upside down, rolling around on the couch. Um, this is available on hypernorm.com. Um, gosh. Um, I'll just keep talking. Um, so this works on iOS, Android, it works on desktops. It works very well on, I guess let me get this out of it. So this is on iOS. You just go to hypernorm.com, log the orientation of your screen, and you can move this thing around, and, and so one thing to notice is if you, let's see, if you rotate rightwards, as you're seeing, it makes you go forwards, no matter what your orientation is. I hope it's doing it, I can't see the screen, but tell me if it is. Am I going forwards? Yeah. Yeah, so, so this is, there's some sort of sense to how you can move through the space doing this. Uh, the source code is um, on GitHub, so you can go check it out and change it however you want. How are we doing over there? We're trying not to bump into everybody, but yeah. Clear? There's more, there's more clear space. I'm getting there. So yeah, rotating around to the right, you can, you can turn to see something, and then rotate your head to the right, and then you'll go towards it, so you can nom it. Um, you don't want that one? There we go. No, I'm going to nom it. Yeah, there's some sorts involved. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I catching into? <laughs> Uh, okay. Oh, you. I'm going to get you. Yes, yes, yes. Still one. Still one. Okay. Scooter back to the computer. Keep going, keep going. Yes!
any questions? <laughs> yeah. So if I was what if I was seeing, we were seeing yes, yes, this is the output from the other side. Okay, it's going to be in the art gallery right over there, so you can tell yourself later. Don't injure yourselves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? What's with the foil on the... Uh... On the monkey one? Yeah. Um, that's capacitive input so that when you touch the stuff, things happen. There's instructions. Oh, okay. But that, yeah, it gives you a capacitive connection between yourself and the controls. It's functional as well as pretty. Yeah. Oh, wow, so you've got, wait, you've got something you can do with the oh, yeah. We should talk about this, yeah. yeah. So it works on iOS, um, it works on Android. There are various sort of Google Cardboard and, and various things to slot your phone into a, a headset-like thing yeah. that lets you get the stereo vision effect. Um, so right, the one, the, the one that I was showing on, on here is just a sort of mono effect. You can switch it to stereo and then if you've got, I mean, if you're good at just doing the cross eye thing, then you can do stereo. Well, there are various kinds of things you can slot your phone into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you just hold that one up for a moment so people can see? Um, if you just go to hypernom.com on your phone, if you have a modern enough phone, you'll get that. Yeah. With a wearality headset. What's the fastest you've been able to clear? Yeah. Um, that was pretty good. Yeah, that's not bad. Um, it's much easier with the phone. Um, we're thinking, you know, in the future, this should be uh, you know, a speed run event played on a trampoline. Um, it's much easier on a couch where you can flop around. Don't destroy your phone doing this either. Oh, it's really easy on your phone. You're just like, oh, I'm done. All right, any more uh, questions? Okay, thank you. Here, so again, sorry. I have one more question. Um, you can ask not to use flash protection.